This the waitress, just ordinary person in two minutes does that. How did she do it? What is she doing when she's adding 415 to 287? She's doing this, counting out 415 pennies, then counting out 287 more pennies and telling you how many pennies you would have got if you counted them all from the beginning to the end. But it's a highly educated and very trained to be able to do that with those large numbers quickly. This training is, is something, in spite of the fact that everybody's got it, it's something pretty good because in the 14th century, mathematicians were, they were called who could do that. Almost everybody in our civilization can do that, but I, would, I took this example, you can understand what's involved. What the students are taught, you see, in our particular problems now about physics, there are many bigger numbers. The numbers are much bigger. It's hard to get numbers are so enormous you can't count them directly. And so we've invented a fantastic array of tricks and gimmicks for putting together the numbers, adding, counting, checking, and so forth, without actually doing it the way I could describe what we're trying to do. If I say, I draw this, and I draw that, and I draw this, and I draw that, and I see where the end point is, we don't actually sit down and draw 7,000 arrows and find out where the end point, we have a way of figuring out where it comes, just like we don't actually count 415 pennies and 287 pennies to find out that you owe me 702 pennies, we do it by another trick. This are the tricks of mathematics, and that's all. So that's the part I'm not going to worry about. We're not going to worry about that. So don't relax. You don't have to know mathematics. All you have to know is what it is. All it is is tricky ways of doing something which would be laborious otherwise. <laughs> so what? The, it's true that in the years we have developed enormous abilities in mathematics, and it takes a long time to train the students, and so therefore they're very highly educated in that. But if you ask them why, now we go back to the Mayans, we ask them why the rule? Why, when you wait, for fill up a tub eight times with 365 day markers, it comes out that the Venus is up five times. They don't know. They don't understand at all. The more accurately they can do it, fact that they know that they have to change it by six days and so forth adds nothing to their understanding of it. The student who has learned all this mathematics and is able to make these calculations, not only of Venus and the Mars, uh, the Sun, uh, the, the eclipses and everything else is a super priest, doesn't know why any better. And if he would explain it's nothing but counting days, he would be reduced to the truth on the one hand and to an honest statement that he doesn't understand it. On the other hand, and could tell somebody all about it who doesn't know how to count all these numbers so trickily and so cleverly, as this priest students knew. Okay. Now, probably, I don't know about philosophy of Mayas. We have very little information due to the efficiency of the Spanish conquistadores and, uh, well, mostly their priests who burned all the books. They had hundreds of thousands of books, and there's three left. And one of them has this penis calculation. So that's how we know about that. And uh, just imagine our civilization reduced to three books, the particular ones left by accident, which ones? Eh? So uh, anyway, I get off the subject. If I make this up now. That what I'm saying now is just a story. Suppose now that the students would discuss, or people would discuss the possible meanings of this. Why? Then we begin to think about, well, 8 times 365 is 2920. That's got two twos in it. Now, two is a lucky number, and it has two twos in it. <laughs> and then the 9 represents the god of so-and-so, which is related to Venus, and so forth. And that would be a good argument. Then, but in another city, some other guys getting together who have a different kind of an argument about it. They say, look, now, the fact that there's a 20 at the end, if I subtracted that away first, I get 2900, which is a especially good number from blah, 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 and so on. And they would have different theories. And then someone would come along and say, you know, it doesn't make any difference which one of these theories is right. We still have this fact to go along with. And that is our modern scientific point of view. In the earliest days of science, we got confused arguing philosophically what was a reasonable reason for nature of hoard a vacuum, or it seemed to be nice that well, gods were doing it. Different kinds of psychological reasons for thinking it probably is all right after you discovered what it was. 
These things were never useful for predicting what should happen next, and we soon learned not to make these arguments. It's useless. It doesn't add anything. And so we're not going to make my imaginary Mayan uh, arguments about the various gods that make the numbers. And so I'm left, if I'm a modern scientist, with a description of the situation. All right? Now I prepared the audience. Used up all my time to prepare the audience. Doesn't make any difference. I will continue anyway, in spite of the fact I used up all the time, to uh, describe the theory. And in describing it, I will first describe some part of it. The theory is the properties of light, electrons, and the interaction of light and electrons. It's all one theory. I cut it into three parts that way. And the first thing I'm going to start with is the uh, properties of light. OK? I'm going to tell you some of the properties of light, and I hope, if I can do it, to get to the key point. And then uh, we'll continue in the following lectures to elaborate on it. First, uh, I don't go through the history of the theory of light. It had various things. The first and most important thing I would say is that Newton found out that what we see as white light is a mixture of otherwise purer stuff that's easy to understand. And if you understand how each of the parts works, you just put the mixture back together again. And then you separate the light in the prism, which is done automatically in Auckland very often, at least as far as I can tell, in rainbows. And uh, the various colored, if you would separate light in the prism and take out the part that looked, say, yellow, then you couldn't separate that any further in another prism. It just stayed yellow and all that. That's called monochromatic light, light of one color. So I'm going to discuss all my phenomena for a while with light of one color because it's simpler. The first thing, Newton believed that light was a corpuscular thing and had very, turned out to have very strange properties from that point of view. And it was then explained that many of these strange properties was because, in fact, it was a wave which was wrong. It turned out he was right. It was a particle. It is corpuscular. Uh, the reason that he said it was corpuscular was based on an incorrect guess as to the behavior of waves. And his argument was wrong, logically. But it turned out in the end that it was uh, particles. Now, how I talk about how I know it's particles is this. If we make an instrument to detect light that's as sensitive as it can possibly be made, we make it more and more sensitive. In fact, uh, this thing is called a photomultiplier. And uh, that's not the only instrument. I just take one for an example. It doesn't make any difference how we do it. When we get to light that's sufficiently weak, an instrument to detect it, he is clicks. A pulse, uh, as if it was rain falling on a something, where you get bang, 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 bang. When the light is bright, the rain goes bang, 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 a lot of them. When the light is very dim, boom, 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 small. The particular boom, booms, and the bang, bang, bangs, and so forth are completely out of proportion. The actual rate is enormous, okay, and a little bit less when there's less light. It's very difficult to get it to a boom, boom, boom. You could so dark in here, you wouldn't know what. But uh, this device, to show you an example of how it works, just so you understand, what happens when we detect the weakest possible light is it works like this. There's a metal plate here, made with cesium or something. When light shines on it, it knocks an electron out. Then you have another plate here with a voltage that attracts the electron, so the electron, so to speak, falls. It's attracted and speeds up and hits this plate. When it hits this plate, it's got about 100 volts of energy, it Flatters. Other electrons get knocked out of the two or three, five, perhaps, on the average. Now, those who are attracted to another plate, and they all go sailing down here with another 100 volts, five of them this time, and each one of those knocks out on the average five or six other electrons. Now I got 25, yeah. And that's attracted to another plate, and that hits those, and so on, and you have a maybe 10 or a dozen plates. By the time you get out the other end, you've got such a chunk of charge in electrons, so many of them, you multiply 5 times 5 times 5 times 5, you'll be a long time counting pins to discover how much that is. You get such a tremendous pulse that you can, the number of electrons high enough, it can go directly through circuits and so forth and turn on and off 